who are uh, joining us asynchronously. Uh, both are in China. Uh, uh and uh, and so they they I drop I, I take the files and I drop them into um, we now use this thing called Canvas as our kind of repository for all the class materials. Oh, um, great. And yeah. so students can go in and kind of rewatch these um, presentations at a later date, or in some cases, I, I don't know, maybe they even rewatch them because they were they thought they were so awesome the first time. <laughs> <laughs> But um, but in any event, yeah, it's 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 unusual, and and we've been more or less uh, required to teach this way in the sense that we can't expect the students to be at the class in person. Um, yeah, and I think yeah, that's great. So, actually, yeah. yeah, well, good opportunity for this. At least they can keep up. That's really great, actually. Yeah, and and this is I this is a kind of a new type of class. The, the the vice chancellor put this program together like two years ago where they asked each department to create kind of an introductory class that would help first year students better get a sense of like what what each of the different majors might be like. That's really and cool. So I had this idea of, you know, just kind of collecting alumni stories basically and having alumni come back and talk about, you know, the trajectory of their sort of academic and professional careers. And uh, and so you you are one of those stories. <laughs> uh, it's really great. Uh, I'm actually quite honored to do so. Um, but I think this is a very great class because I, I didn't have much sense of reality when we started the intro to architecture. So that's I think I'm, I'm glad they have it and, and glad you lead it. <laughs> that's really cool. Uh, well, maybe we'll start. I think we have pretty yeah. much everybody here now. And yeah. Um, yeah. So I'll, I'll let you go ahead and just sort of introduce yourself and tell your story because I think you're going to do it a whole lot better than I could ever do it. Um, uh, okay, well, I mean, approximately, I can introduce myself to the presentation because this basically encompasses the past 20 years uh, since I've started going to MIT. Um, so my name is Suyeon Chang, and currently I'm in London doing a Zoom call with you all together. And um, I basically run my own office called uh, Atelier Chang ATC. Um, and as you can see, um, let's just rewind back to year 2000 when I arrived at MIT for the first time. So when I arrived at MIT, I carried two things in my suitcase on top of clothing and what, whatnot. One was a Total Recall DVD, and the other was Mind Children, written by Hans Murbeck. These weren't exactly in an architect's handbook or a beautiful monograph of Tadalando, but they reflected how I was slightly off the topic from typical architecture. So Muravec, I'll do a segue a little bit, um, predicted that human race will upload our consciousness to machines to a new stage of evolution. In his vision, uh, he developed this landscape of human competence is what you're looking at right now on the slide that shows different industries that will be taken over by the AI in the coming years. The water level signifies AI surpassing human capacity, and the peaks are where this flooding of AI would reach the last. And what's great to see in this as an architect is that art and architecture and other creative industry will be the last to, to be submerged along with science and literature. And you are in the right class for this reason. So now at MIT, when I started course four, Dandy Memorial Drive, it was a um, pretty fascinating combination of pupils and professors. For instance, um, in the second year studio, I was challenged by a professor if I could make the final model in actual building material. So we're talking about concrete and glass in, in the case of my project. So I made a tiny formworks with PVC to pour concrete in and cut glass by hand. So the thickness of the glass was a bit out of scale because this model in reality will be around, um, I think it's probably like one to uh, 25 scale, it's quite big. The thickness of glass is a bit out of scale, but I managed to claim that high honor that he promised with that model. So MIT for me was a place where we learned to think with our hands and let the mind explore whatever accidents you may find on the way. <clears throat> In my later years, I met my lifelong mentor, Professor Mi Jin Yoon. 
Back then, she was just started uh, started working at MIT as a 29 year old Korean American woman. And when we spoke one to one, the story about her particular interest in materials and their impact on architecture was the most inspiring 15 minutes at MIT. So for her, architecture was not just building buildings. And eventually she became my thesis advisor and taught me the joy of staying till 2 a.m. and making objects that did not look anything like architecture. So she would say, oh, Suyan, I would never push you more than I would push myself. And that was really, really high bar to set. So she taught me how to structure and formulate my concept in architecture to reality, which would, believe or not, dictate how I approach architecture in the next 10 or more years. So on top of doing thesis with her, I worked on a, a, an establishing material library for the architecture department there, where we explore the possibilities of conventional or non-conventional materials in architectural context. Here is a laser cut basswood that became flexible screen and then submerged in silicon. All these random but great experiences probably motivate me to go over to course three classrooms and start listening to the material science basics and to Media Lab to do some internship over summer there uh, to prototype mobile ar architecture based on fabric and steel construction and also listening to the world's best AI leaders and philosophers to feed on my own uh, hunger for knowledge. Quite oftentimes, these are unrelated topics to architecture. It was, for me, like walking through a mall of knowledge. And coming back to course four, I saw possibilities in architecture in different directions if we collaborate with other industries. So now the other side of Cambridge. So at the end of the undergraduate program at MIT, I decided to go to Harvard GSD instead of going through an expedited program at MIT. So instead of spending two more years to get master, I actually decided to spend three and a half more years at Harvard. The major reason was the interdisciplinary nature of the GSD, where typical architects, urban designers, landscape designers, planners, and real estate students would sit under one roof and do a studio together. In the beginning, I carried my deep interest for material and develop that further through weaving things. So this is a very first project called uh, Bridging Between Facades, where we had to create a library between two well-known architects' facades. I weave my way into both facades to mediate the context between two strong architectural concepts. Then in, it went on, this weaving um, idea further to develop um, another system for a studio um, run by Toshiko Mori at Harvard at that time. It was a mature class. My partners and I ended up um, creating a woven honeycomb structure for a foldable table that can collapse into one inch thickness when you're not using it. So there at Harvard, um, I started to integrate um, uh, a lot of digital production and fabrication techniques that was giving me a new trajectory. So as you see in this image on the top left corner, that's a 3 print, 3D printed version of the table. And then we had to basically make it into a one-to-one -one scale um, table, which is actually the, the, the large image. So new tra uh, trajectory. Um, I'm going to just go slightly into my thesis, because I think it has a pretty interesting another trajectory afterwards. So typically, for thesis, in master degree, people design airports, music halls, houses, etc., as their final uh, statements in their school. So everyone dreamt of uh, becoming uh, the star architect in those days. I'm sure they do that still now in architecture school. <laughs> Not a good way to go for architecture. <laughs> but um, for me, um, it was a bit more about finding out a formula. So a formula that best structures how I approach a project or a concept based on a context, based on a multiple parameters in reality and giving it a brand new form mixed um, with a bit of a tweak as a result. 
So I was investigating the city of Basel in Switzerland with Jacques Herzog and Pierre de Moron as my advisors. And this um, looks a bit like a brainstorm for coding, and it is so, in fact. So on the left are parameters such as legal, economic, environmental factors, and going into more specifics in constraints of lights and height of an urban volumes in the middle, then adding a bit of a recipe of preservation as another parameter at the end, it would hopefully arrive at something tangible in building massing. And this, um, good old days. Um, how would I carry out this operation in the scale of the city? I basically had to operate this massing and uh, massing maneuvers in endless number of uh, blocks, maybe uh, hundreds at that point. So it seemed inevitable coding had to help out. Back then, there's not many parametric software available for us. So I ended up using uh, Katia, which uh, Frank Gehry was using back then. I, I realized um, there is a Frank Gehry building in your uh, campus, which was one of my favorite buildings. <laughs> and um, it was a very high time for um, Katia to be distributed to the students, actually. We had it for free in our school. So, um, so I was dealing with hundreds of blocks in the city, and Katia played a crucial role in quickly applying all these parameters in sequence at once. So um, just to explain what I'm babbling about, um, here is the existing massing of the city. And I'll demonstrate the zoning envelope according to density. I just added all typical legal constraints, like height to width ratio of a block. So then we upped the density just a bit. Then this is the maximum density allowed by the zoning building rack, as well as the proxi proximity to open space. So I'm adding a bit more density as well as different parameters on top. And now this um, maps up the whole city in three phases of growth I just talked about. Um, so I'm just going to try to point at it for a second. So as you see, um, what looks like a, what looks like topography lines show potential area areas of so-called um, peaks where taller buildings are allowed to be built uh, according to my parametric modeling. So in fact, uh, so we're talking about these areas where you see denser or steeper kind of mountains um, of the analysis, some are like here. And in fact, that is where the new developments by Novartis, the biggest pharma uh, based in Basel were locating their headquarters in reality. So we had some, this had a kind of realistic um, projection of where in a city or any city your high rise can actually happen and you can visualize it quite quickly. So where to densify, that's the question, I guess. Then the parameters can now add a bit more subjective factors like favoring open spaces, adjustable setback, um, and the view corridors, et cetera, et cetera, to allow people to access open spaces better. So in this particular, um, uh, trajectory in the modeling. It was a lot about um, uh, orienting all the urban massing toward um, an open space or green space, basically. Then we arrived at some eccentric but very thought through urban reality here. And funnily enough, uh, during my final review, um, the reviewers are negotiating who's going to buy this image for um, how much because they actually were quite liked it. <laughs> and um, Pierre, my advisor, kept raising the price, so it didn't end up selling. Um, anyways, excitement. And even though it was not a typical architectural thesis, Jacques and Pierre offered me an invitation to join their office in Basel during my final review. Um, so I will talk about that experience just a moment later. Just skipping to just our continuation of parametric urbanism, the parametric urbanism I investigated at Harvard ended up reaching out to a professor at APFL. Uh, it's one of the um, uh, federal universities in Switzerland, just one of the two, where um, I was teaching from uh, year 2011. There, I met students and colleagues that looked further into how we could propose better cities in conjunction with the nature. So, um, for instance, 
we would, we would be uh, running a, a course called Organicities, uh, typically geared toward how to run an organic city based on the food production and the water and wind and all these factors put together. There I found um, very bright and very enthusiastic students, some of uh, who later became part of my, my practice, in fact. I'll just go through this very quickly. These are kind of the students' works who basically um, stem from a lot of teaching that we've done. This is Carol and Camille's project on creating housing in Chinese farming city with parameters based on natural terrain and slopes. And different density of housing is deployed in the alleys using parametric modeling called um, grasshopper. So these are kind of the end results, mostly massing based and very specific models on those. This is a project by Christopher and uh, Johan, where typical courtyard volume was responding to the topography again and lighting conditions, along with the, um, how public and private spaces were distributed. And this is a rendering of a typical courtyard, which is for us, um, Chinese architecture had a lot of a traditional reference back to the courtyards. This is kind of our contemporary interpretation um, that came out of our grasshopper modeling. So um, back where we left off when Jacques offered me the job in Basel. So I ended up working in Herzog and Dumran for five years afterwards, after Harvard. So it was uh, really amazing to see such diverse and rigorous concepts that materialized into actual stadiums, museums, and concert halls located all over the world. And in the middle of this small city where there wasn't much to do, the office was um, more than a workplace where people would talk and exchange ideas during two mandatory coffee breaks a day. That's a Swiss thing. <laughs> not in the US, <laughs> and occasional swimming lessons, uh, swimming sessions in the river during lunchtime. And I wanted to show you guys one project that was done by a small team of four people uh, for the Portsmouth Stadium in the UK. Uh, it was a master plan project that included a, a stadium at the end of the site. So <clears throat> imagine um, yourselves, guys, um, at 5 p.m design meeting with Jacques and Pierre, the partners of the office, um, the day before they fly out for the client presentation. And we have all our booklets ready, all the posters ready to go. And then Jacques said, we need to come up with a, an entirely new concept. And he kind of drew, or kind of drew, drew this mysterious sketch and he left for home. So we had to prep the entire booklet in one night where we explored this gigantic, but fortunately minimal structure of a stadium based on an open pitch and forest-like columns, as you can see on both of the sections of the building. And I was in charge of the stadium design and um, um, me and my colleagues, my interns, we were taught by the best of the best stadium architects who worked on the Allianz Stadium. If you guys are football fans, you would definitely know this stadium. <laughs> and the Beijing Olympic Stadium also, um, back in Chinese, Chinese Olympic, um, what was it, 2000 something, 2008, I think. Um, the key factor was how columns would dictate the, uh, the public flow, where 24,000 people would have to move in and out over the course of a few minutes. So I overlaid some grids according to program and came up with a seemingly random but quite nice um, column layouts. And surprisingly, when you look at the plans, this is called plans, so you're looking at the building from top down, um, there weren't many walls in, on the plan. Instead, those dots that you see on the left side, um, these are columns. They represent columns that organized every level of plans. And the boxes on the right side that you see indicate the uh, VIP area and the other public program like um, food area, public bathrooms, um, all those um, pierce through the columns basically. So long story short, the stadium design ended up being built by Bordeaux Football Club in France prior to World Cup and um, it was completed after I left the office. But 
I was very lucky to see how the entire concept that we prepared over nine months, um, staying up nights, ended up being built as um, I imagined them. There I worked closely with one of the partners who worked on uh, Tate Modern and other museums. Harry Gruber was my boss at first, but he also became one who inspired me to start my own office and became a mentor in practice in the years to come. And um, then I started Atelier Chang in the year 2011 in Zurich, in Switzerland. We kind of remember back the time at the time where we were at MIT and all the practices that we've done at Hertz and Dumeran, we carried out carried on the rigorous tradition of uh, making everything by hands and genealogy of models to dictate our final concept. These are just a few of a really rough but insightful models that evolved and evolved and evolved afterwards into tens of iterations. The first project in the office um, started with <laughs> just tying 20 to 30 knots on a paper ribbons. And this was the beginning of the nut houses, obviously the name. Uh, the beauty um, these models were, um, the beauty of these models were um, they would give us something quite unpredictable and simultaneously very realistic in spaces. That once again is the plan. It's uh, the building that actually ended up being built uh, and the plan, when you look at it, some might ask, how does someone live in here? <laughs> so, um, but what was interesting was they uh, lived very happily inside with a very open view in the front. So when these buildings were deployed on site, it was on a very hilly site looking over the, the ocean. We proposed uh, two types of these knot houses that somehow blur the boundary between outside landscape and the inside of the building. The front of the, all these buildings opened up to the ocean view, while um, back of the back was totally private in the tight section of um, our knot um, model, basically. So you guys, um, we end up having a bit of a unique entrance situation here. So to our surprise with this project, um, we won several awards and it gave us tremendous confidence to put our projects forward to the world that are slightly more unconventional. And ap right afterwards, we were getting interested in kind of mini houses concept that are built with alternative construction method. And incidentally, a client approached us and asked if we could design something interesting about glamping. So glamping is a very large tent structure that people sometimes live in or stay uh, overnight. And instead of giving them um, a teepee, which we could have done, we entered this interesting realm between buildings and temporary structure with excitement. So that is called a mountain. Um, so this entire series of buildings it reminded um, me of the fabric structures I explored in Media Lab back at MIT. So fabric, if done right, can become a sustainable building facade with proper insulation and services inside, but built in much more minimal way in much shorter time. This is called Firefly. Um, the fact of the matter is that 40% of CO2 emission originate from the construction sites, the construction industry, and on top of the debris and the waste that it creates. But this mobile structure built on steel frame and double layer of a woven PVC would be able to stand in the middle of nature with almost a zero harm to its ecosystem. So this was a project called SJCC, where um, such ecological mini houses, or AKA glamping pods, offered amazing in nature experience to the visitors in Korea. And we went to a step a bit further. Um, so learning from the glamping pods, we just realized how minimally and how efficiently we could actually make buildings happen. Um, so 
So we thought about more new construction system that can be built like an origami on site. So in this series called mini houses, they don't require any structural beams or column. Um, well, in reality, they needed just a bit, maybe a few, <laughs> but only uh, it, they only stand from the strength of strength that's given by folded steel plates. So some prototypes are built, but this is one of our our passionate genre of architecture that we believe will solve housing crisis in many countries. So um, this is a case of the uh, house in Wonju, where um, you can see on the left side, the big plates that are the maximum size you can carry in a truck is welded and the, the overall um, facade is very thin. Typically a wall, uh, the brick wall, concrete wall, be typically 400 or 500 millimeter. All these walls are practically a hundred millimeter or less. So this offered a lot more interior spaces, a lot faster construction, and a lot lighter um, construction, um, as well as shorter period of time. So um, I'll go into probably one of the last projects for our office. Another project um, that started, it, it also started from very unpredictable models. Some might say, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> you know, playing with this uh, paper strips again. It is called a vault house project that just completed this year. So there are three modules of vaulted spaces lying upright or sideways to create an accidental spaces inside. And here is a living room we absolutely loved where you feel you're half outside and half inside. And our, our, a lot of our concepts are kind of this open spaces being invited back into the interior. And now what people influenced me at this point. So in London, we have a small group called the uh, London Five kind of refers back to some historical group of architects. Uh, these are friends with their own practices. Um, we met most of them in Zaha Hadid office, actually. Uh, we share tears and laughs have, uh, about how tough and exciting it is to run our own businesses in architecture. From right to left, Rob is running labs in UPenn on flying drones that self-build uh, with ejecting concrete. Uh, and Dewa, the, the second from the right, is a Zen architect at the boundary of art and architecture at a spiritual level. And Marco has his parametric beauties um, and Arthur, who did, who did the Burning Man Galaxia. These guys push each other to do something more interesting than architecture all the time. That's the topic in the next chapter, Beyond Architecture. Um, so the last section of uh, my lecture. So last year, I was invited as an artist for a pavilion for a museum in Korea in a quite a overwhelming site, right by a parking lot, in fact. Um, and it's their entrance to the museum. And But just like our architecture projects, I started with models in my hands, testing light and mechanism. And this is using basically a film called dichroic film. And when it's applied on a, a tube like this, it basically emits multiple colors and it basically transforms its appearance according to how the light is uh, emitted, uh, no, how light is coming through the tube in relation to the user's location. So, um, what we wanted to do was um, to create a responsive environment where even a small push would propagate and influence the whole structure. In eight by 20 meter plan, or uh, sorry, in eight by 20 meter span, Ripple Pavilion, now it'll be called, would float a bit like a wave and invite visitor to touch. And at the end of the day, the pavilion will change colors and texture because of the individual interaction. And the whole surface of pavilion will be a constantly responding and transforming artwork, mainly driven by the users and also wind. And here is the reality. Um, it looks smaller than the actual um, the build structure. Um, so, and I wanted to end this presentation with a movie of the Ripple Pavilion that will kind of leave you bewildered and confused. But <laughs> my point here is, I think architecture will always flourish and evolve uh, where you think beyond just building buildings. And I'll start the um, 
very artsy video of this pavilion for your experience. So this one, thank you. And um, I'm really happy to receive any questions or any confusions or anything <laughs> that you need to clarify with me. Yeah. So feel free to ask. I was wondering. Yeah. Um, when you did the like, density thing with the like building taller buildings in mm. the one in Europe yeah like, what would be a consequence if you built like a taller building in one of the areas that wasn't like super dense I guess or like doing it in the places that weren't super dark right so that's exactly how we took account of um these with these um, volumes. So in the beginning, basically, we would um, be able to locate the taller buildings, only it has, um, it casts, it doesn't cast enough shadows to the neighborhood. So for instance, if you were building it in the middle of housing, it would pretty much uh, affect the housing around it. So usually the taller ones would be only allowed to be built right by an open space or right when it's when it at least has like two open spaces nearby so um so that was already part of the factor so what ended up happening was usually um around parks or bigger parks something that happened in manhattan basically happened like you know in manhattan during uh, around central park there are very many high rises that has that's slightly driven by real estate also because you know if you have a view to the park the the, the price of the, the flat is a lot higher but in my formula it was driven to be higher around the, the big bigger open spaces like uh, parks because it, that exactly what you're pointing out the shadow wouldn't would affect the the um the other buildings a lot less because of that so it, that would, the, the, the questions you're asking, very common questions, which is embedded into regulation, was how uh, we were able to come up with this massing to begin with. Yeah, so that was starting point. Mm -hmm. but I think Jacques and Pierre, um, they really looked at this thesis as like, their way to manipulate the city. <laughs> They'll basically justify, them, justify themselves to say to the city that, you know, we're allowed to build here or higher. There was an area where actually there wasn't much high buildings yet, but basically the architects saw the potential that that could be a new proposed site for them. 
or high rise. Yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> Um, I was wondering like what your like day to day is like as an architect and like like running your own firm and like what that's like. Oh <laughs> it's um it's different every day. So um like seasonally it's even different. I'm like a salmon basically. Um so in architecture industry there's like a lot of a peak in um fall. A lot of buildings happen. So, um, and in summer, what I do is I travel to a lot of sites and I get requests to go travel. So I travel for about a month or two and I accumulate a lot of uh, projects. And then, so during one or two months, it's kind of trouble time. And then um, in fall, basically all the contracts are signed and um, we start working um, together. So um, it's very typical daily practice of I drop my kids off to school <laughs> and then um, go to the office and um, you get some random calls so um, I don't know sometimes you get projects uh, we actually got a lot of projects just from cold calls so that would be something I'll be dealing with most of the time and acquiring projects is a big part of um, a partner's uh, or uh, the founder's kind of role you know when you run your own practice so you would think sometimes uh, you would imagine this amazing genius architect sitting in front of a desk, you know, making beautiful 3D models is majority of your time. But if you run your own practice, actually, you're spending more than half of your time um, trying to find projects or trying to kind of come up with a project or trying to work with people who could give you a project. So that part I didn't know until I graduated. And it was really big shock for me that I had to spend this much time talking to people. <laughs> but surprisingly, um, I think at the end of the day, my first project came from the, the Nut House project, it came from a phone call. Just we were talking about something else, like trying to help out Herzog and Demeron to do something in Korea for furniture. And he ended up asking me, can you just do this project yourself? So um, and I think um, at the end of the day, um, if you want to run your own office, which I think it's a dream of every architect, which I don't recommend to everyone actually, because it's it's tough. It's not easy. It, it makes you cry. Um, but um, I think a lot of it will be um, having friends around you uh, who are really great designers, but also having friends <laughs> who are not architects. They will be the one who will be helping you through um, acquiring projects and whatnot. So, um, so, and then, so at the end of the day, I guess, um, uh, daily schedule wise, practically, yeah, we um, come home, put my kids to sleep, and then either I go out to meet, uh, meet other people, or I basically um, do a bit more work, um, typically until 12 sometimes, because um, when you do international projects, that's when they wake up also. So I do some conference calls at like 1am, something like that suits their schedule very well so um so it's a bit endless effort and it it, it it goes on for quite a while for an architecture practice to establish well i think but um yeah <laughs> that's a daily thing yep tears and laughs yes <laughs> any other questions because nobody told me this when i was starting course four um, and, and, and I think it was like, almost like a, nobody tell you like how moms give birth until you give it and you're like, oh my gosh, that's interesting. So um, <laughs> just um, ask me away. Like if you guys have questions, you can always also email me. I, I'm very chatty as you can tell. Um, so yeah, any other questions that's mysterious for you? There's, there's a question that um, somebody typed in the chat. Uh, is there sure. anyone? Is there anyone in particular whose work or any parts of life you tend to draw inspiration from? Uh, yeah, I think um, I, I think definitely uh, Herzog and Dummer was they were one of them definitely, and also Zoom tour. Um, I tend to have a very Swiss oriented um, uh, tendency for this, but I think their works are timeless. So when I look at a lot of, when you look at a um, magazine, you know, like you check out a lot of trendy architecture that are just literally flashing in front of your eyes. Um, 
I had those inspirations too, but I think these two architects, the Herzog and Dimran and Zumthor, you look at it 10 years later, 40 years later, I think they're definitely coming from somewhere that's, that will never age. It's, it comes from somewhere very unique um, and it's very appealing to kind of like a, the old history of human, uh, uh, yeah, human history basically. So yeah, they're the two uh, or three people, I guess. Um, yeah, and two of them, I work for them. And it shattered my fantasy about them <laughs> while working for them. <laughs> so, uh, but at the same time, I learned so much what not to do and what to do. And to be honest, a lot of architects tend to um, kind of think that you kind of sacrifice your life to do design. But these guys were really going out on a biking at 6 p.m. sharp. They had their life, you know, the coffee breaks where people can relax in between this architectural um, intensity was was exactly how they could come up with a really, really good design. So, yeah. At your ear, I didn't have anybody that I was looking up to. <laughs> I was just, yeah, I didn't have courses like this. Um, any other questions? Um, I was wondering, because you, I feel like, I don't know, you tend to um, do a lot of your work like either in Europe or like in Korea, etc. Like, how is it? <laughs> to like work yeah. with like people from like different places or like going there, or, like, et cetera. Mm. Yeah, it's not easy because architecture, you kind of want to be on site to oversee the, the construction process or to deal with the clients even. But I actually, um, I think the current technology has um, helped us a lot, especially when you look at into a construction, we basically communicate through images and videos and we even like um, uh, exchange our coordinates for what to pour where via uh, like digital modeling and um, daily chats, basically. Like I, when I wake up in the morning, I would have like 50 chats from our construction uh, manager on site. But also um, it involves uh, for me to travel a lot, which is not easy sometimes with kids. I used to take them always on the plane with me when they're one and a half. Um, and, but I think some distance at the end of the day, also it created interesting opportunities too, I think also, because you are able to look at things a bit more in a, not an immediate way, but also at a, a bit of like more objective way when you're far away from it. So that kind of gave us a lot of advantages in communicating with the clients with a bit of more objectivity and, um, yeah, but overall, um, I think at the end of the day, even though you work with different clients, they're all humans and they basically are very similar at the end of the day. So, <laughs> and especially I was trained by these Asian clients first and so nothing came harder afterwards. Yeah, they all wanted their project like yesterday. And for SJCC, we actually were supposed to start the concept and actually submit planning uh, drawing, which is like end, end of schematic, um, early DD. In, in one week. And I said, no, I, that, that, that's not how we design. <laughs> so that's how tough the Asian um, uh, clients are. But part of it is um, when it doesn't work, just tell them honestly and, and let them learn like um, that the way <laughs> design works. If you want good design, don't, don't do that that way. So I had a lot of fights with the clients also, yeah. Any other questions? We I'm really it. curious. Yeah, go. Uh, we go, we go, missed go. a question here. Um, it, oh, it, yeah. It, it, uh, this is Annalise. She says, uh, or asks, uh, did you have someone compose the music for your video? It sounds like it mimics the ripples. Oh, that credit goes to my um, producer. She chose, she basically gave me several music and she actually bought it online. But what she did was um, she recomposed certain parts to be overlapping over each other, just to make the impact of that whole, um, the tubes that are kind of overlapping and kind of, um, um, yeah, this pro, uh, uh, yeah, this impact. So she actually recomposed the music after we bought it. Yeah. Her name is Irina Song. She's so talented. 
Yeah. I actually have to see the questions, don't I? They sometimes appear in the chat. Um, yeah. Okay, I'll do my best to figure this out. Q and A. Ah, okay. Good. Please feel free to read it for me because I still can't find that. Um, I'm such an old lady now. Anything else? Um, I mean, to be really honest with you, um, yeah, I think during COVID, there has been huge interest in um, this minimal structure, the fabric structure we've done, um, like a glamping and stuff. Now we'll be doing exactly that, but times um, five times in scale in Tokyo uh, near Fuji Mountain. And it was kind of surprising because a lot of practices died away during COVID. Um, a lot of, you know, um, the real estate market has kind of like um, pushed down while everything that's related to nature it's ecological or people actually going into nature, that lineage of that industry has gone up so quickly that um, right after the quarantine, we start getting calls from like really random countries like Saudi Arabia and um, uh, some other Eastern European countries also and, and Hong Kong, Singapore, China, Australia, all of them all happening at the same time. So sometimes I think COVID was a very horrible experience. It still is for a lot of us, but um, I think people's mind is changing um, or it has changed quite a bit in terms of how they want, what type, what type of architecture they want, basically. Uh, any other questions? <laughs> I have a sort of general question. I'm, I'm just curious to know, like, yeah. are there overarching questions that you like to explore in the architecture that you sort of create? Is there something like a specific mm -hmm. um, question that like you come mm -hmm. back to again and again that you are trying to explore? Uh, I definitely think so. It's not a conscious part of it, but um, so the parts of Hans Moravec's kind of like how does AI kind of interact with architecture always comes back to me. So when we did the pavilion, for instance, um, it was kind of for us, it was the kind of a place where we could experiment with that a little bit. Like how would an automatically responsive environment um, be realized uh, in in reality, this was actually a very hot topic when we were at MIT also at the, at the media lab. Um, like an environment that's kind of, that has its own intelligence and its own kind of, that it, it, it just, it's not about a grand um, architect coming into, coming in with a big uh, brush and kind of sketches the big figure and the genius building appears. I, we no longer believe in that. And one of the things I believe would happen is I think a great collaboration with um, type of this computer science engineering and um, something that we, uh, if we give intelligence to the building itself, I think it'll come back to us in a complete different form. So that's something I'm constantly interested in. And, um, and I think um, also one topic that we always have a, as an overarching thing is that we don't want building to have much boundary. So as in, um, even the building is always composed of walls, we always want the people to experience what's outside, quite oftentimes in nature. So we want building to be more of a mediator between the human experience and their environment, rather than um, as opposed to a building becoming a protector from the environment. And I think that's how actually architecture started in the beginning. You kind of need a safe place to be. Um, but I think our building kind of breaks that boundary a little bit just so that we can reintroduce nature to flood into your living room or, and you are constantly aware of the, uh, aware of the, the constant existence of nature or whatever, it could be nature, it could be your neighbor, 
could be your um, urban context, whatever. Uh, and the, in, the, 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 the enclosure of the, the architecture should be able to respond to that all the time, in fact, yeah. So that kind of boundary, blurred boundary between inside and outside, that's another overarching topic. Uh, and, 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 and also, I think, I believe, um, parametric architecture will have its place um, very soon in urban scale. So what we, I've done with thesis, um, I'm still an architect, but I always, in the back of my mind, I always have this idea that um, there will be a benefit of how architects put their heads together and come up with a really good either regulation or coding system or, or some kind of um, black box that they could actually operate with that it will benefit um, maybe not like an ex 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 existing uh, cities that are already dense but a new cities that are happening to become more ecological and more environmental friendly. Yeah, so very confusing three points, uh, but yes, kind of back there all the time. Mm -hmm. But your objective changes over time when client asks for something else. <laughs> so just be flexible. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Maybe you guys are curious. Maybe not about me, maybe how about you guys. <laughs> what should you be doing now to become a parade architect? Things like that. <laughs> what should I read <laughs> now? Yeah. Well, I think we can, we can, if, if there aren't any other questions, we can mm -hmm. let you go and get back to work because I'm guessing, uh, although what time is it where you are now? Uh, it's around 10 p.m. Right, um, yeah. 19. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but I thank you so much for, uh, you know, agreeing to to take some time out to present to us today. I think it's uh, it's really great, and um, and I was I'm glad I found you. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's really it to me. It's really um, it's interesting because like to find the right person, like. It's, it's easy enough to find, let's say, a person who graduated and has been practicing for 30 years and they have a, a, a body of work that they can sort of present to you and talk about. And we're going to have one of those coming up in a couple of weeks, mm -hmm. uh, preservation side. But it's, it's a little harder when you want somebody relatively young because it takes a while to go from graduate school to starting a practice to having what we might call a body of work and you know in and but that's a nice person to find because i think you're still young enough to sound like a student but at the same time you've been a, you've been in the business long enough to have established a kind of a a, 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 a a a reputation a certain body of work that talks a little bit about how you translated your school work into you know your professional work um, yeah i think um me Jin Yun told me this actually before that um to me particularly um Suyan, so you're really good at this project because you're very naive. Because you're naive, you think you can do anything, and you keep proposing these things that are really, you know, impossible sometimes. <laughs> but I think that's something I took it as a kind of like a kind of like a whip on my face. But at the same time, I I, I took it as a very nice advice um, to keep your minds open and hopefully try to kind of retain the mentality um, of a student because you keep learning. Just to let you guys know, typically architects peak age is 60. <laughs> but um, yeah, a lot of, but there are a lot of famous ones that are peaking at 50. Um, so this is a long kind of haul thing. So be patient and actually like just try all different things as much as you can, yeah. Good. All right. Well, thank you for the invitation. <laughs> and welcome. if you guys have any questions, um, ask Paul. I would be more than happy to explain you in private and try to drag you down to become my intern at some point. So, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, thank you for today. All right. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye, bye, everybody. We'll see you again bye. next bye. time. Yes. Bye. Bye. bye now. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.